education. COVID has introduced uncertainty into every aspect of our life. In fact, it has introduced uncertainty into life itself. We will all remember at the start of this uh, pandemic in, in, in Barbados and the Caribbean that we all ran and hide and hid. And uh, many of us continue uh, to, to do that, the most vulnerable in society. So COVID has introduced great uncertainty in every aspect of our life, whether it be our business lives, our personal lives, what our future might be. So with that, let me just make a few other introductory comments. Oh, if I can change. There we go. So understanding uh, a bit about terror, um, I first would like to say that on the call, who will help us ask, answer some of your questions at the end, is also uh, Hayden Hutton, our Chief Operating Officer, and uh, Rachel McCartney, uh, the leader of our brokerage uh, division here in Barbados. Um, the very DNA of, uh, of terror helps us in these significant uncertain times. Our mission is simply to ensure our clients feel comfortable and confident to make informed decisions. And we place that on top of our core values of knowledge, excellence, innovation, caring, and integrity. Integrity, not just what you see us do, but what we do behind closed doors. And I, I felt it important to make that point early on. I don't want to dwell on it, but what we're going to be doing today is trying to share with you information that maybe will help you get more comfortable, more confident to make better decisions that you need to make. We can't make them for you. We don't have any crystal ball and, 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 and we, we don't know exactly what will happen, but we will be able to point to uh, indicators uh, that will help you. So with that, I'd like to frame the discussion um, in recognizing it, uh, in talking about real estate, um, we must remember at all times that real estate is a long-term investment. And COVID-19 at the end of the day is a short-term phenomenon. Whether you believe that there is going to be a vaccination next week or next year, or you don't believe there's ever going to be a vaccination and you think there's going to be a therapeutic care, care uh, for it, or you don't believe there's going to be a therapeutic care and you believe there's going to be herd immunity, at some point in time, you're talking about a 12, 24, 36 month at the outside uh, phenomenon that we're dealing with. And real estate is a longer term investment than even that. So if you listen to nothing else that I might say today, um, I would say to you, listen to this. Do not make long term decisions based upon short term influences. Real estate is a long term decision that you need to make but COVID-19 is a short-term phenomenon. There may be lasting changes that come from this, and we'll talk about those, but COVID-19 itself is likely to be short-term in the bigger scheme of understanding real estate. So what we're gonna talk about is, let's look at some leading indicators that we might have in our market. But then we're gonna talk about the impact specifically on the hospitality, the commercial, and the residential market. And I've taken them in that order because that is likely to be the order of which the uh, impacts upon real estate have happened. Hospitality first, then trickled into the commercial and ultimately back into the residential market. I'm going to look at some macro factors for the Barbados market um, and then get to some specific questions which may be on the minds of, of people who are, who are listening and watching today. Specifically, hey, I'm a seller. What am I meant to do in this market right now? I'm a seller of an investment property or I'm a seller of, of, of my home or I'm a buyer. I'm looking to buy uh, something that was an investment property or is my home. What should I do today? Uh, again, I'll say we may not have the exact answer for you because it will, it will vary, but perhaps we'll give you some ideas as to things that you should consider in answering that question. And then we will spend most of the time, I hope, in the Q&A section. So let's jump right on into it. What are the leading indicators? Where are we at? And perhaps this will be the, uh, the slide that will make us split our wrists, but uh, hopefully not. Um, the reality is that tourism is somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of our economy. It might even be more. What I can definitely say to you is that I believe that 95 percent of Barbadians are directly affected by tourism. 95 percent. And I say that because whether you're a jet ski operator or a taxi driver, 
or you own a hotel or you work in a hotel or you're a rental car company or a restaurant or you're in the distribution trade selling to restaurants and hotels and, and, and so on or you're in the agriculture sector or you're in construction. All of us have a brother, a sister, a cousin, a mother, a father, a child who are directly affected by tourism in Barbados. If you ever wanted to know how, what part of the economy tourism played, you have a great time to look at it because between April 1 and June 30th, in that, uh, that quarter, there is little to no tourism in Barbados. Anyone who is here is a Barbadian and long-term resident, or there may be a few hundred, if that, tourists left here on the island. So we know exactly what tourism means for us. That has led to nearly 50 thousand layoff claims. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but that is, uh, that is approaching 40%, somewhere between 30 and 40% uh, of the employed uh, people uh, you're looking at late or have been laid off. The claims for, pre for severance at present sitting before the NIS now uh, are, are 1,800. So these are people who have actually lost their jobs. Now those 1,800, the vast majority of them are pre-COVID. That's the backlog that's in NIS, and that really should have been dealt with before, and that's a different subject. But that is going to get higher and higher. Uh, what's happened in, this, in the private sector is, uh, is salary cuts, uh, and obviously there's been, there's been reduction in, in, in headcount as well. In the, uh, in the public sector, there's the government boss program, which fundamentally delays a poor part of, of the, uh, of the uh, person's um, uh, salary until a later date through a bond program. Uh, the financial institutions, the banks have, have led with uh, offering delays in payments on loans, and I highlight delay. It's not a, it's not a, a forgiveness, or it's not a, uh, you know, anything else. It's a delay. You can pay us uh, later. We just won't take action now. There has been significant focus on self-sufficiency in agriculture. I don't know anyone who doesn't have someone in their family who has started a kitchen garden or, or, or something. It's been very interesting and we're quickly learning uh, the difficulties that our uh, agriculture sector has in, in, in trying to grow things uh, and bring them to market. There's been a significant tightening of the belt, not just to cost businesses, but we've all felt it and we all know that we have to do things differently given this uh, significant reduction in the economy. The Prime Minister has spoken about um, uh, the reduction in the GDP. And in every time the PM speaks or anyone speaks, you hear the number going up. Uh, if tourism is somewhere from 30 to 50% of our economy, and for one quarter we have had zero, um, then you can extrapolate where it goes from there. And as you will see in some other numbers, uh, that uh, part of our economy is not likely to come back with any strength for six to nine months. Uh, more. Uh, so we are looking at a reduction of our GDP that's probably going to be in the region of 30 to 40 percent. The other thing that it has about though is a change in our personal behaviors. Uh, some of it has been imposed on us, um, you know, frugality, uh, austerity, uh, what are in fact our core values? What it, it's been interesting uh, for me as a family with, with, with four kids between what, 14 and 21, the amount of time that you spend together uh, because of the, um, of the shutdown. Um, so it has changed our focus. So that's the, re the reality. And those are some of the leading indicators of what is actually happening in our market. Um, let's deal first with hospitality. And I said I wanted to, to, to intentionally take hospitality first because that is where the abrupt, immediate impact came. Now, we practice in this area within Blue Sky Luxury where we are a, a villa rentals, villa management. And fundamentally, by the second week of April or the first week of April, we had less than 5% of our projected revenue. You, you, can, you can argue and say, well, we were lucky because it happened at the end of our uh, tourism season in Barbados, but we lost probably a week or 10 days in March, and we've lost April, May, June, and it is likely uh, that we're losing more than that. So those are, that's an entire quarter with fundamentally zero revenue for the hospitality sector, uh, and that is why the layoffs happened so quickly within the hotel area. 
the airlift um, from that period once the airport closed basically was at zero. Um, as it stands today, we don't have any uh, published uh, protocols for the reopening. Um, the reopening date of July 1 has been announced, but uh, there is no protocol to say what will happen, how you will come here, what happens if you, when you do come, um, do you go into to quarantine, can you go straight to a hotel? The, 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 that has not yet been, been published. Um, it's being worked on, and, and, and I have been part of that being worked on, but it's with government at this point now to make a final decision. Based upon what I can see, we will be lucky to get 10% of the airlift um, that uh, we normally have in July, and we might get back to 20% in, 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 in August through November. So that is the number of seats coming into Barbados, in and out of Barbados, is likely to be in the 20% range all the way through no November. By December, when the tourist season um, really starts back, uh, that's when the airlines are really saying that they may be able to, to, to get back going again. But still, best case scenario that we have seen is probably 50% of the airlift. Now, if you drill that down into what does that mean for, for hotels, again, this is on average. And, and, and while we practice in the hospitality area, uh, when you take these averages and generalizations, you have to be careful. But on average, a hotel at 35% occupancy, it's losing money, but it's contributing towards its fixed costs. So it arguably makes sense to, to remain open for a short period of time at 35% occupancy. Somewhere around 60% occupancy is a break-even point in the Barbadian uh, uh, hotels. So that's at the point where not only is it fixed expenses, it's variable expenses, everything paid, but it is, it is actually going to break even or be profitable. With 6,600 hotel rooms on, approximately on, on the island, uh, and we had probably the best winter um, was the 2019-2020 winter, if not the best winter, one of the best that we've ever seen. And uh, during that period, we would have had one million available airline seats in the 12-month period um, of 2019 to 2020. Based upon what we know now over the next 12 months, it is likely that the total available airline seats is going to be about 400,000. So if that is correct, what you're looking at is that a maximum you could get back to 40% of where you are. Remember, back between 35% and 60% being the break-even point, the best case scenario, therefore, is to achieve an average occupancy around 50%. Average occupancy. So that does mean that there are going to be some hotels that are going to stay shut. Some hotels, just, it just makes no sense for them to reopen. It does mean that, um, well, we'll talk about the villas separately. In other markets, the, you know, you have green shoots where uh, they've started to back up and they're in the country, the people moving from, from one place to another within the country. We don't have that luxury in Barbados. We rely almost entirely on people crossing our borders to fill our, our hospitality section. And if there is no profitability within the hospitality segment, uh, then there is no investment. Uh, they can't refurb, they can't expand, they can do nothing. And that's why you have government stimulus and support for the sector in the sense of you know, the, the extended um, uh, layoff period uh, prior to severance, you have the uh, loans being made for, for back payments and, and other incentives that government knows that they have to do in order to keep the sector alive so that when it does come back, we still we have operating hotels. The bill of fact is in a different position because generally the middle to high end in the term often is used in small apartments as well, and the rent is a villa. Some of it, uh, owners, uh, their return is generally not cash based. The, 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 the vast majority of these villas don't make money. Uh, they keep people occupied year round and they have to send money in every month to cover the, uh, the, the expenses. So expenses are paid by remittances. So the villa sector is different than a hotel, uh, the hotel sector, completely different prices. The vast majority of the villa sector employees have been kept working at the actual villas. Villa companies like my own, which rely on, um, uh, on, the, on the occupancy, that's a different situation. But the villas themselves have mainly kept their, their people employed, which is a good thing for Barbados. They've given us some buffer. 
So that's the, the hospitality sector, which, uh, as I say, that was the, you know, these are the slit your wrist type of, um, uh, of presentation pages. In the offshore sector, if you look at the commercial market, the offshore sector is impacted really by the global economy. The local economy does not affect that. We have other factors that other experts can talk about uh, about the the the, the, uh, the offshore sector to do with the grey list, black list, the you know all, all of those things. But really, our local economy does not affect them directly. What will affect them is if we have um, unrest um, or hardship in the local economy then maybe we're not a great place for, for them to be. So hopefully we avoid that. Um, but every other sector is impacted as a result of tour, tour, tourism. Um, when I originally did this, it was 40,000 people, and, and then I got the data this morning from the NAS that said 50,000, and it's uh, laid off people as opposed to, to, to unemployed. But even when you're laid off and you're getting 40% of the max, um, uh, you are, or 60%, excuse me, uh, your spending patterns change. And when your spending patterns change, um, and that happens also with, uh, with the BOSS program, um, you have to, re you know, if you rethink what you're doing, retail, restaurant, et cetera, that affects uh, the utilization um, of all of those companies. So the, the knock-on effect to that throughout the commercial market, uh, you, we, you would have seen, uh, Many uh, retail operations were closed, and they're going to be asking their landlords for a um, uh, waiver on rent, reduction in rent. All of that impacts the commercial um, segment. Now, when there's reduced investment, as I said uh, above, the construction sector is hit hard. I think we all are aware of many different projects that have been put on hold. Uh, you know, there's, there's a there's an effort to, to stimulate that part so that we can keep that construction sector going. You would have seen that that was the first sector that uh, was reopened um, uh, and, and for medical reasons, but also for, for, for economic reasons why that had to be reopened. But if we look at a couple of little, let's look at one small little industry, which I used to participate in, and I, I still have a lot of friends in there and I've heard the, the, the discussions. There's over 1,700 new cars in stock. You don't have to be an expert. You can drive through Wilby and look at, uh, uh, at the car dealership on your right-hand side there and see that every blade of grass is covered by a new car. Take a drive through Warren's, same thing. Head down to River Road, same thing. Go past your used car dealers, everyone is stopped. There's 1,700 new cars in stock. Current rate is supply now, two years of, of stock. The rental car fleets, everyone is trying to offload their cars. They're flooding the, the, the market with it. So that's, I'm just pointing that out as in the commercial market on the effects of COVID, there is all of these knock on. And then that affects warehouse space, office space. We could talk for hours about, you know, working from home and what the changes that means to people who finally, who were saying, well, I don't actually need to be in the office. So do I need less office space? And there's a lot of that going on. But then you also have the situation where people say, but we want to not cram as many people into the office as we did before. We need to maintain social distancing. So that has the opposite effect. That means that you need more space for the same number of people. But in general, what COVID has taught us is that we can work somewhat effectively. We can make different decisions, and that affects the office space uh, market as well. Um, and I think from a real estate point of view, and putting on my Barbados hat, what I've heard many of my clients say is, if I have to work from home, and all I really need is a good telecom connection, where do I want to call home? And we have been very lucky here in Barbados. We've had a number of people who have homes, uh, wealthy people who have homes in Barbados, who have, to who have chosen to shelter in Barbados. And they're telling their friends about it. And when they, they post their pictures and tell people about it, it's a great place to be. So if you are not going to be in the office and you could work from anywhere, why not work from, from, from a home in, uh, in, in Barbados? And we certainly, from a real estate point of view, will be, will be uh, spending some time promoting that. Uh, that then takes us through into the residential sector. So what has happened there? Uh, we were on the strongest trajectory ever, frankly, going into 2020. Um, the market was improving. You would have seen our red book, what we've written on the statistics with that. We were 
definitely heading in the right direction. But the, in, the economic impact to follow from COVID will dampen this substantially. The domestic market is more vulnerable, obviously, with that number of people on layoff, a reduction in the GDP. We were already at oversupplied on vacant land sales. That will continue to slow. The price and pressure on that is going to continue to fall, uh, to, 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 to follow. New construction will have to slow as a result of the existing built supply is absorbed. It's going to take longer to absorb that. People probably will think about the home and the look for home offices and how they, they build out. And maybe that third bedroom that you know was uh, for a friend to visit is converted. I think many of us may have done that. Uh, it'll become part of the demand preferences in new home designs. The foreign market, though, is a different uh, is a different animal as I, as I talked before. We have actually seen a few significant sales in the high end market uh, during lockdown. People doing virtual tours uh, and saying, I'd prefer to be in Barbados. I would prefer to be there. And uh, Rachel and her team have been extremely successful during this period when we thought nothing would happen. There have been some very a good few sales. Um, and as I said before, the Barbados' position in the global bar market may approve of that. And uh, we've got to be careful not to be too clever on this. <clears throat> what I think we know today, it is changing every day. The dynamics of this, we need to continue to watch it. So those are your general uh, things that are happening in those three segments. What I wanted to again also talk about is the macro factors. And we're going to come to the specifics and especially to your questions. But the reality is that real estate in general is affected by four factors. The, democratic, the demographics, interest rates, the economy itself, and government policies and stimulus. Those four factors, you can look in any market uh, around the world, and that is going to drive real estate value. The demographics on Barbados is not good, frankly. Uh, our population has seen little or no growth. Many of you would have heard me speak about this many years ago, and the, you know, different people have jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, we need to have more babies, we need to do this. I don't make that comment. I make the comment from a real estate point of view that the reality is that our population has not grown. Our growth in our real estate market locally has come from two things, an increase in wealth within the population, people moving into a growing middle class who wanted a better home, uh, extended families who split up in multiple homes, uh, and foreign investment coming in, into the golf courses, the marinas, the beachfront property, the, the condos. That's where the uh, home solutions have grown. Uh, but new wealth gives rise to different uh, living patterns. And the shift in the age profile of our population, which is shifting to older and older, that makes a difference in what people, wherever they want to live. Do they want freestanding homes? Do they want to live in apartments and condominiums? How do they want to live? And of course, we can affect our population by encouraging more visitors to have homes here, encouraging more Im immigrants, encouraging returning residents, having some form of residency by investment uh, 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 program. Those types of things can affect our demographics. If we do them effectively, we we'll have growth. With growth comes the growth in value. Interest rates, the cost of capital availability, capital affects value, uh, affect the values of real estate uh, significantly. And uh, we, we have seen that interest rates have been steadily declining in, 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 in Barbados over the last, uh, Sherry Ann can comment to it, but probably 10 years that they have been coming down. I'm seeing some of the lowest rates today, and that affects the valuations on, 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 on real estate, especially on commercial uh, property, where we're seeing in the market, we're seeing uh, commercial interest rates in the 4% range. Uh, the ease of the process to achieve borrowing uh, also affects um, uh, the value of, of, of property, and that I'll speak to you a little bit later, but that not perhaps has not moved as fast as we would like. The economy itself, I've spoken about it, and the growth in the economy, unemployment rates, all of that affects the value of, 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 um, of, of real estate. And lastly, government policies. What is our taxation? You would have all seen the changes in uh, land tax rates for uh, on improved land, which is approaching 1% now. Um, you know, that, that affects the value significantly of just holding a, a, a piece of property. If 1% of your capital gain is eroded every year, 
from uh, land tax alone. You have to question the long-term viability of holding vacant land. Uh, TCPO policy on the supply of, of, of subdivided lots and so on, that affects it. As well as what can affect it is uh, industry reform. And we have for a long time needed that reform in Barbados, both for the legal side and for the mortgage for processing. Not the bank's willingness to lend, but the process that one has to go through in that lending. We have a highly inefficient real estate market. Real estate at the end of the day is one of the most inefficient um, mechanisms of investment because it's, it's a, a big lump going in and it's the same big lump coming out. You can't divide it up into pieces. And if the process takes long, like what it does in Barbados, three months on average, sometimes four months, it makes it even more illiquid. So if we're going to change that, what better time than now to change it? And that needs a lot of reform in the legal side. Those improvements will drive liquidity. So I think this is the one before last slide. I don't know how am I doing for time? Oh, it might be 30 minutes. Good. Uh, when is a good time to sell? And I, I joke with people about this all, all this, but it's true. A good time to sell is when the buyer has to buy and you don't have to sell. That's when you are most likely to get the highest price for your property. Similarly, when is a good time to buy? When you don't have to buy, but the seller is, is, has to sell, you, you know, when there's a foreclosure or someone's you know, got to get cash quickly, that's a great time to buy. So what does that mean for you in the market today? So if you say to me, you are a seller, my advice to you, our advice to you, would be to get ahead of the market. Don't follow the market. Make sure you get good advice as to what is, in fact, a price for your property today that it can transact at. We have seen for too long, too often, people who follow the market downwards. They never get ahead of the market to actually achieve a transaction. So how did you set your price? Who advised you? What market research did you do in, in, in setting We're having some technical difficulties. Please, um, uh, by until and you get back in. And somebody else from the Tara group take over the control of the presentation. Darian, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, yes. It seems as if Andrew is still having a challenge with his audio. So what we'll do is be nimble, and I will let him just come in by me, and we'll continue. Okay. Turn off people's audios. All right, well, don't forget to mute your um, microphones. We're getting some feedback from some people, please. Are you able to mute them yourself? Okay. Yeah. Please remember to mute your microphones. Can anybody see or hear me? Yes, 
can hear you. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you now, Andrew. What's going on? All right, I've swapped. Oh, I don't know what the heck happened there, but uh, let's just try <laughs> to um, get this back going here. Um, is everything good there? Can I continue? Yes, for sure, yeah. Okay, great. So, so what I was saying is that uh, uh, I was on the seller, and I'm finishing up by saying that if you can hold, now is a good time for you to delay in this time of great uncertainty. Um, so that would be our recommendation from a selling point of view. If you're not achieving, if you know that you've gotten the right advice on the price and the, you're not seeing the deal flow through, come through to you, you may want to consider holding or, or, or delaying your, your sale. From a buyer point of view, I'd say it's a great time to be able to move quickly. There are going to be very few buyers who are going to be in that position uh, in the short term who are willing to make a quick decision. Well, I'm just involved in a property seminar here at the moment. Can we give a shout back in about 20? If someone could mute whoever that was. All right, so Do you have anything in place, uh, a lawyer, financing, etc.? Do you have an agent on your side searching the market because there's going to be deals out there and you need to make sure someone is scouring the market for you? And I go back to what I said earlier. Remember, this is a long-term investment. Um, this is probably an 18 to 20. There's probably an 18 to 24-month window when uncertainty can work in your favor if you are well informed. I'll say that again. Uncertainty can work in your favor if you're the one well informed. And I, I, I pull a quote here from Warren Buffett. Uh, who says, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fear fearful. And I suspect that the latter part of that set sentence is what matters right now. Be greedy when others are fearful. So with that, Sherry Ann, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will do a little bit of Q&A. But while I'm doing that, I would ask you if you could remember to put the PDF of, of this um, uh, uh, of this presentation into the um, into the chat so one can download it. Um, as I say, Katie and myself, uh, Rachel, will take the video, but also if you to click through into the 2020 version of the Red Book, which will have a lot of data for you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, uh, Terry Ann. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that informative um, presentation. We apologize for the um, technical difficulties that we were having, and we also apologize to, to those who were unable to join the call this morning. I am still looking at emails with a good number of persons saying that they can't get on. Luckily, we were able to record the um, presentation, so if you did miss it, um, any, any part of the presentation, you can always we're going to be able to have it available. I would get, I'll pass it on to Tara, and we will also have it at RBC. Um, should you need a copy, you can reach out to um, any of us. Um, as it goes to the presentation, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to make it available as soon as I'm finished the question and answer, just in case we have any further technical difficulties, right? So we have um, a first question, Andrew. Um, Keisha is asking, you spoke briefly about the TCPO regulations with respect to subdivision as it pertains to the supply of land. Can you explain a bit further? Yeah, so I say, not so much the regulations, TCPO, but the overall general policy. Um, we were talking about the, the, the factors that affect uh, real estate, and TCPO policy on how much land is, is coming available affects it. Right now, there is there's certainly an excess of uh, subdivided uh, residential lots. Um, so that has driven the price down because there's an oversupply. So TCPO policy, if they were to tighten policy and not allow um, many more or a lot more uh, uh, residential lots until some of that supply was taken up, that would um, reduce supply with a reducing supply and a stable demand, one would expect price growth again. So I wasn't so much commenting about their current, uh, the actual detailed policy, but the macro environment is we have more land subdivided today than we have uh, users for. Please, let's um, don't forget to mute um, the mic, please. Your mic. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. What's the next question? Oh, that was that was that was the end of my answer. So, what's the next question, please? Yeah, the next question is um, this is from Jason. 
any views on the implications for long-term rental market if people cannot sell slash or buy um, people are not going to buy will there be more or less opportunity for long-term rentals the long-term rental market um, last year has most been affected by the uh, by Ross University Ross University starting here in um, uh, in January um, you know made a huge difference to the a number of properties that were available because Ross took up uh, so much of the market. A bit of a challenge because Ross has announced that they will not be returning physically uh, their students on until January at the earliest. So over the next uh, six months, um, that is going to impact the long -term market because those folks will not be uh, be, be, be renting. So is there an opportunity if you can't sell to go to the long-term market? Yes, there is, but I expect that the prices in the short term will be depressed. Again, I, I point out that this is a short-term phenomenon from just back uh, on the island looking for, for, for rental property. Okay, thank you. Next question is, the one single change that would rein in the subdivision craze is to make monetary underground infrastructure and just sorry, just get back. Infrastructure. Come in. And fully paved roads. He wants to know what's your um, thoughts on that? Well, th th there certainly is an argument for, for underground utilities from the, because the reality is that we can get you here again. Very, very lucky and not wood and everybody please not wood together. That's 1955 since we've had a storm of significance. But, um, uh, underground utilities help in, in that situation. So, I mean, on the other hand, uh, and, and you can argue the aesthetics of it, none of us like to see the wires and, and all of that, uh, so on. But it's, it's expensive, um, and that drives up pricing. So, um, I, I don't know that I have an opinion on that. I think there is room in the market for, for, for both because we do need affordable um, uh, uh, land. Uh, but it would be nice to think that all of our infrastructure could be underground where it is more resilient uh, to, 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 to the, uh, the environment that we're in. Hope that answers. Okay, next question is, what does the commercial market currently look like in the Bridgetown downtown district? Oh, oh. Um, that's a tough one. Can you have any comments on, on, on the changes that have happened in Bridgetown over the last few years? Don't know if Hayden, are you unmuted, Hayden? In case he's are not you okay? on, like it. Yeah, go right ahead, Hayden. Yeah, I don't think that the, um, the outlook from Bridgetown at this point in time is going to be great. Obviously, Prime Bridgetown is very reliant on um, high street retail tenants, so they are going to be under pressure. The office market has been... Uh, under pressure in Bridgetown for more than 10 years now. So outlook not good, but the sunshine on the horizon is, is new development, whether that's for the higher. And everyone here, Hayden, I've lost him. All right, Hayden, just un unmute yourself, please. I just tried to um, mute everyone. So just back again. Okay. Yeah, you were, yep. and we heard you Sorry, all right, Hayden. Yep, just saying that um, higher the development of the Korean Edge, uh, all generally building blocks uh, for the future, but there will be short-term pressure, no doubt about it. Okay, um, thank you, Aiden. Um, the next question that's coming in. Any evidence of price, price cuts to galvanize sales in the luxury market? Price cuts in the luxury market. Uh, Rachel, are you there? You're our luxury expert. What have you been seeing over the last uh, six months or anything immediately from COVID? Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So within the last three months, we haven't seen much um, reduction on list prices as yet. Um, generally, owners are still in a bit of a wait and see period. Um, we have had offers that have come in that are substantially less than the list day prices. 
And um, we're seeing that owners are willing now, within the last, I would say, three to four weeks, to do a deal or to take a little bit less than they would have pre-COVID. Um, so um, it's a it's a bit of an unknown at the moment, but um, where prices will go. But we're definitely seeing a lot more interest in owners to be negotiable. Mary Ann, can we have your next question? Sorry about that. Um, the next question is, is there financing available to U.S. investors in Barbados? I think that would more um, pertain to RBC. You can always give us a, send me an email, sherryann.born at rbc.com, because we, we do offer um, financing to non-resident um, customers. Now, there's another one. Um, it, yes, it may be a good time to buy, but do you anticipate any reduction or significant reduction in the price of real estate, both land and property now and in the near future? But as I think I was saying in the, in the presentation, the, the, the value of real estate is driven by many factors. Um, and uh, I think COVID is a short-term uh, phenomenon, but it may have long-term implications to the uh, economy itself. So with the economy, which we'll see 30% drop in GDP uh, over a 12-month period, if not longer, uh, there's no doubt that there's going to be less money circulating around and people will want to pay less and some people will have to sell. So I would, it, would, it is very, very clear to me that there is going to be little or no price growth in general in the Barbados market over the next 12 months. And that is why I was saying that if you are in a position that you don't have to sell, um, then it's a good time to consider what your options are. However, if you are in a position where you want to sell for whatever, there may be some event in your life that requires liquidity, uh, you need to get ahead of the market and move quickly because there are going to be very few buyers out there. Okay. The next question is, do you feel an amusement park would be well received if the local community on a commercial and macro level, and how do you think it will help tourism? Um, okay, well, the, I, I, it depends, uh, but uh, an amusement park, um, I don't know if I'm an expert. Let, 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 let's, let's say it this way. The more uh, arrows that we have to shoot in our bow in catching people, the better we are. So the more attractions that we have and the access to things, that is a great uh, uh, plan. So an amusement park, which would be another um, thing to do in Barbados. Um, so I think in general that would be a good idea. But it has struggled. If you look at the history of amusement parks in Barbados, if I, I, the last one that I remember was the, uh, the mini golf and the golf driving range and water park thought that they had. It's very difficult if you are uh, only relying on uh, a short tourism sector, so a short tourism season to be profitable. Those types of um, uh, investments tend to be capital intensive, and if they're done on significant debt, they require a lot of throughput. So I'm not an expert in amusement parks, but I can say that having more things to do in Barbados would generally be a good thing for the, uh, for, 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 for the island, but I'm cautious because we just don't have the footfall to make those, um, uh, those things profitable. Okay. The next question is, what reduction in residential rate, rental rate is recommended in this market? I don't think that we have any recommendation on that. That would require quite a generalization. I would go back to the, uh, the comment that I made that I think that you need to understand where you're getting your information from. Have you, in fact, worked with an advisor, an agent, someone who is knowledgeable, who is helping you to set what that rate might be? So there are some people that definitely need a reduction. There are some people that who could get more. Uh, and our job in the industry is to, is to try to create a market where both sides have enough information that they can make a good decision. That probably gives me a, a, a good opportunity, sherri to say to give you one of my favorite sayings, and I'm, I'm claiming this is my own, which is that I tell people often that uh, I am most successful as a real estate agent when both my buyer and seller equally unhappy. That means that uh, the buyer says, boy, I sold that too cheap. 
and the and the seller says uh, the, sorry the buyer says you know I, I I pay too much for that and the seller says oh it's, I, I I sold that for too little they're both equally unhappy so our goal is to and I say it in a joking way but our goal is to give the market as much information as they can so that the participants can make the best decision so in answer to the specific question I can't tell you that that the property you're talking about requires a reduction. It might actually might actually deserve an increase, so, but you need to get good advice. Okay. The next question is, Andrew, what role do you see the BEAVA agents and valuers playing in advising clients during this time? Well, BEAVA, which is the, for those who don't know, it's the Barbados Estate Agents and Valuers Association, is an industry group which has set um, standards and, and conducts of behavior and so on for its members. And I do think that uh, uh, the general public uh, working with uh, agents and valuers who have the seal of approval of an industry standard uh, is a good thing. And um, I think that like the Bankers Association or the Accountants Association or the Architects Association, there's a role there for, 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 for BIVA and I would suggest to the general market that when they do search for an agent or a valuer, they should be searching for one that has, uh, has signed on to those, uh, those industry um, uh, norms, those in industry guides, those industry services. So I do think that there is a role, but at the end of the day, people do not make the market. The market itself makes it, and people participates and tries to uh, help people uh, be informed as well. So I'm sorry I can't give a more specific answer than that, but Viva is a good thing, and you should be working with a Viva agent or a valuer, but uh, that's just my opinion. Okay, the next question is, what are you seeing in the luxury rentals? Yeah, so uh, luxury rentals, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Um, this is like some dominoes here that are falling. Uh, without airlift, we have no rentals. Uh, so right now, as I said, you know, for July, if anyone could tell me what flights would be coming into the island from international destinations and what the people can do when they get here, I'd love to know. So we really have very little forward bookings for July. August goes up a little bit more, and then September through November is, uh, is, is, is very slow traditionally. Um, we're hoping that there's going to be some pent-up demand for those people who missed their Easter in Barbados or, or with our, you know, uh, attractive offers to get people back here that some people will travel. But there's so many factors. One, there is airlift. Two, people have to be comfortable in flying again. Three, Barbados' protocols, what we do in terms of testing people or not testing and what quarantine, that's here. But today... If you come to Barbados for a seven-day holiday and you're coming from the UK, when you go back home, you've got to spend 14 days in lockdown and quarantine at home. So would you travel on that basis? It's a very complicated answer. But at the luxury end, what we do know at the highest luxury end is that that's the first part of the market that will come back because those people stay in higher-end hotels, higher-end villas. They come for longer uh, they travel at the front of the plane or even private. Their experience with travel is different to me who goes to, uh, to Florida uh, in the back of the plane. That's a different travel experience. So at the luxury end, we need the airlift. When we get the airlift, I believe we'll get the people. But in order to do that, we need to understand the protocols, not only in Barbados, but in the source markets. The most important ones, of course, being the UK, and the eastern seaboard, both of Canada and of, of, of the United States. Okay. The next question is, sales price can be driven by negotiation and current need of the seller and the readiness of the buyer. But as a general status, do you see from a valuation standpoint generally a reduction in property values, given that property values have decreased significantly over the last few years? Well, the question ended with a statement. The statement was property values decreased significantly over the last few years. I, I would not agree with the statement, so it's difficult for me to respond to the question. Um, there has been a reduction in certain areas of, um, of, of the market. In general, land has, uh, raw land has come down in value. Um, uh, but I would not have said that there was, a, a, in the last few years, a general decrease in the market. In fact, some parts of the market, we've seen strong appreciation in value. Uh, 
But so let's leave the last part of the, the question out and go to the first part, which I think was fundamentally negotiation drives value. And I agree completely. And that's where I go back to uh, having informed both buyers and sellers, making it informed of negotiations. They will come to a meeting of the mind that um, is reflective of the market. And uh, that's where we see our role for sure. So thank you for that question. Okay. Next question is, what is the demand in the downtown Bridgetown area for residential rental market, if any? Rachel or Hayden, you want to help me with that one? Well, I, I think maybe the first thing to address is the supply. I'm not sure what segment of the market the person posing any question is referring to, but there isn't much supply. Um, so I would probably start there. And just suggest that until such time as there's um, more activity, Bridgetown continues to be all things equal um, a, a daytime activity. There's no real sort of nighttime trade, and, and, and that is one of the downfalls. So I think until such time as there's a more broad offering, um, we need to be honest and say that unfortunately there's not really a compelling reason to want to be in Bridgetown. So we typically don't combine residential in urban areas. That may change, again, with things like the Hyatt, where they're proposing to do residential units on top of the hotel within the Bridgetown area. But I think it will be some time before we get there. Okay. The next question is, you mentioned airline seats. But what is the impact, both short-term and long-term, of the downturn of the cruise line industry? And what are your thoughts on what type of return the normalcy and timing of this industry and Barbados? I, I think, frankly, that I'm not a cruise expert. I mean, I have been on a few committees and I've heard, I mean, I think the leading person who knows about cruises in Barbados is Martin. Um, and so I, I can't speak to that. What I can speak to is the impact that the cruise industry does have on our economy. And there is a segment of our economy um, uh, that relies a lot on tourism. You have um, a lot of the attractions that someone was asking about before. They are heavily trafficked by by the cruise stores, and so you have you know St. Nicholas Abbey and the and uh, you know uh, you you could probably name them better than me, but 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 all the catamaran cruises and the boatyards of this world and so on. And that is a significant part of of of, of the uh, economy that is driven by that. The taxi operators, the tour companies. Um, so I don't know, uh, I'm struggling to figure out the protocols for villas, far less to figure out how any of us will feel comfortable again going on a cruise ship, um, you know, with that many people combined to a space for, for seven days. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, Sherry Ann, but I would think that neither me, Rachel, or Hayden are your experts in that area. Okay. The next question is, Andrew, I'm currently living aboard. Would it be a good idea to buy a residential home site on sea? Never a good idea. That's kind of like choosing a husband without a first date. Um, I, I would not, and in fact, in our firm, uh, we generally, unless there are very, very specific circumstances, we would not even accept an offer from someone to buy a property that they have not seen. It is not a good idea. You need to go and see it yourself. They're all, and even from, a, let me turn the, the thing around from a vendor's point of view. If you're selling a property and someone is buying it from you and they've never been to the property, you open yourself up to a myriad of legal issues that could possibly come out. Because what that means then is that that person has relied completely on either your video tour or your flyer or statements that you have made they haven't and themselves seen the property and they will rely on those things. So I'm not a lawyer, but my experience has been, and our firm policy is, the firm Terra Group policy, is that we do not, unless there is very specific circumstances, ever accept offers from people for properties that they have not seen. So don't do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. Typically, outside of COVID-19, how strong is the apartment rent until the market will be driven, not particularly the tourist sector, sector? How stable is it typically, and are apartment buildings located more on board of the island or outboard up towards the coast? Rich? Six. I got off. 
So um, the residential market um, for for Bajans, um is generally a, um, a a good market. It's it's very, it's stable. Once the prices for these apartments are are in line with market with market rent. Um, for the apartment buildings, um, they are scattered all around. I mean, there's there's apartments inland and also out towards the coast. So um, it would be both. Okay. Next question from Sabatree. I understand the UK is contemplating a bubble between itself and certain European countries that are considered safer. If travel was a was to a safer country, there will be no quarantine on return. Do you know whether we're talk we're taking to them about similar? We're talking to them about similar, sorry. Yeah, um but question Savitri, which is not is on is not on real estate, but the HTA director of tourism out of hat and say yes, uh, very much so. We've been talking to Canada, um, our Prime Minister has been leading the discussions with uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, as well as the discussions with uh, Prime Minister Johnson on, um, you know, leading from the point of view that Barbados has, in fact, no COVID other than in Harrison Point. And we have, we've done an extremely good job and our health people have done an extremely good job of this. And if there should be any bubble or, or air bridge and all these different words, uh, we could have it between those countries. And the uh, the BBC did run a story first thing this morning, and I think that's what you're referring to, Savitri, where uh, certain countries within the European Union who have low COVID rates, the UK um, is also believed that there are four people coming from there. And I immediately personally sent that on to RPM and said, we need to get onto this because uh, obviously between Barbados and the UK, that would be a huge bonus for us if people coming from the UK knew, knew that when they returned, they did not have to, to quarantine. And we also have the situation with Canada because Canada has done a pretty good job as well of, of, of managing uh, COVID. And we have a lot of Barbadians, uh, especially in the uh, education sector, who need to return to Canada and right now they have a two week quarantine as well, which is going to be very, very difficult uh, for, for those kids who have to go up there. So that is being discussed as well. So your question, do I know if it's being discussed? I can tell you it is definitely being discussed at the highest level from prime minister to prime minister. And I'm very, very hopeful, fingers crossed. Okay, next question is, can persons who are still interested in purchasing residential land during this time expect price reductions on land being offered in certain residential developments such as the Grove, Adams Castle, or Southview, et cetera. Hayden, you're the expert in all three of those developments, I believe. To better understand your definition of expert, um, one general comment um, before I answer the question. There have been a few questions around pricing. And, and, and just a reminder, you know, we use the terms cost, price, and value interchangeably. But oftentimes there's no relationship between them. You know, what you your cost is what you're paid, and your price is what you're asking, the value is what you would get. And as a market, we tend to be very overpriced, and, 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 and that is a function of the flow of information and the extent to which the participants are informed. So I would certainly encourage everybody to, to not be put off um, by a high price when someone is asking, but rather to speak to a Beaver member to really understand the value, you know, how to approach that. As it relates to the developments they've asked about, we've actually seen a bit of an uptick in those developments uh, between the Grove and Southview. Um, you know, the reality is those land prices dropped from $30 to $18, 40% drop, and they've slowly crept up. What's probably going to happen is that's going to plateau, but I think you'll find in all those developments that there's going to be a willing air from the developer. So we'd be delighted to submit an offer on your behalf today. Feel free to reach out to Rachel. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Andrew correctly pointed out that the land tax rates are now eroding value at a 1% per annually. Also, land prices have fallen as well as property values. Can Beaver make a special plea for a reduction in land tax rates? 
as far as I'm aware, uh, Biva has written on that on that matter, um, but it's a very difficult situation that the government finds itself in. Land tax in Barbados is, uh, at the end of the day, is, is a wealth tax. Um, if you own property, you're seen to be wealthy, and, and uh, the government has come through uh, 10 years of, uh, of, of very difficult times with eroding uh, uh, income, and they've had to bridge that gap. We can't continue to run at a deficit. So that's where that they went to. Now, do I think they went too far? As a as a as a, as a participant in the industry, I would say in in some areas I think that the the rate is too high. Um, but the amount of tax you pay is a combination really of three factors. It is the value of your property, the rate of the tax, and whether or not you are uh, specifically uh, uh, any any relief is available to you. So there are people who get significant relief because they may be pensioners or they may not just have the ability to pay. Um, so it's hard for me to say uh, exactly that we should bring the rates down uh, because the amount of tax you pay, as I say, is a combination of rate and value. What I would say is that this year is a land tax valuation year. It's a triannual process in Barbados. And um, the government has delayed sending out the land tax bills this year uh, so as you know, recognizing the situation, but when those bills do come out, if you look at it and you and you see the value uh, and you think that the value of that property is higher than what you would reasonably expect in the market, my advice would be for you to consider an objection because this is the year that you can object. Um, if you don't object this year, you're stuck with that value for the next three years. Um, in order to object, you can object without a valuer. Um, my recommendation would be to engage a valuer to advise you whether or not it is worthwhile objecting. Um, and if it is, and in a lot of cases it is, um, you could place an objection, you can bring the value down, and then the tax you pay is a combination of value and rate. So that would be my, my thought, but I would come back again and say the government has to bridge its revenue, its, that gap that it has from somewhere. And land tax is one of the places that, that they're doing. And sorry to dwell on, the other thing I would like to say on this is that uh, part of the reason why governments increased vacant land rates as high as they did was to encourage people to provide housing solutions and not just sit on empty land. We do have a lot of empty residential lots that are not productive. And it may not be a bad thing that the land tax rate for vacant lots are, is encouraging people to build houses on it as opposed to sit on it uh, for a longer time. You could disagree with me on that, and I do appreciate it, but that is one of the things that that rate does. Sherry Ann? Okay. The next question, um, are banks in Barbados still offering mortgages for residential property purchases? And if yes, has it become more difficult due to COVID-19? I can um, answer on behalf of RBC, we are still offering residential properties, we, um, residential mortgages, we're very much still open for business, and the assessment process is no different than it was before COVID-19. All right, um, the next question is, what are your thoughts of the potential of a boutique beachfront condominium on the West Coast in the next year or two? Something. If we have an advisory engagement, I think the person needs to send me an email and let me send them a fee proposal. But uh, a, a, a beachfront boutique, ask me that again, Sherry, a beachfront on the west. Beachfront condominium on the west coast in the next year or two. Hayden, could you speak to supply and demand for, for that particular part of the market on the west? I know we have a lot of statistics in the Red Book on it, but I think you're at the top of your mind there. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that short question, long answer. Generally speaking, we're in oversupply um, with beachfront condos on the West, and you don't need to look any further than the 2020 Red Book to answer that question. So I think that to have a successful project, one would want to have something that addresses a gap in the market, something that's currently not offered by the already existing glut of supply. Um, and a thoughtful, more creative approach to the marketing of that product because there's substantial supply, you know, selling 30 odd units a year when you have 200 plus units, that's that you have a fair bit of supply. So short question, long answer. Okay. The next
next question is, is there a homeless population? Is there a program to restore abandoned properties, residential, this is in St. Andrew, or hotels in St. Peter, affordable housing program to the first time buyers? Um, I'm sorry, but I think that's kind of out of our wheelhouse. I, 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 I'm not able to answer that. I don't know. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, what is the financing options for Canadian in, um, investors? Um, just asking you guys if for financing, any kind of financing questions that you have, you can send me an email afterwards, sherryann.born at rbc.com. I will share the email um, at the last when we are finished as well. Okay, I think that actually brings it to the end of our questions. Um, thank you very much, Andrew and team, for the presentation. It was very informative and also answering all the questions at the end for your time, because we know that, you know, um, presenting this to a free audience would have been still um, cost consuming for our Tara. So on behalf of RBC and the audience, we'd like to say thank you. Well, thank you, Sherry. And I would like to reiterate what I said at the beginning. I think that RBC um, has done a great job of, 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 of providing useful um, seminars. I hope people find this use, useful today. Certainly was in our enjoyment to do it. Now. Work with you. Um, I would like to just to remind everyone that the PDF will be put in the chat, or if you want to reach out to any of us directly, we'd be happy to share the PDF of the presentation uh, with you, which has the link into the Red Book. So it has been our pleasure as well to do this, Cherry Anna. Thank you for the opportunity, and I thank everyone who has uh, who has participated. Thank you.